was a different kind of music making than anything I had ever experienced. We'd start off with something that would be going along, and Octavius would be playing familiar beats, and all of a sudden, Father would come in with, bam, 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 offbeat, you know, everywhere, whatever he pleased, yelling and screaming, and that, of course, would take it, to, it would break down the concept of everything that you ever thought music should be, and it would take it to a place where you were left out there on the edge of the cliff. <laughs> And every morning after meditation, we would go into the recording studio. We recorded over 65 albums spontaneously. These were some of the most rare and coveted albums for American collectors of psychedelia. Penetration sounds like a ritual in progress, and it's like, what is this? Is it black magic? Is it white magic? There was no concern for commercial success. And the freedom and that spirit, I think, is what sings to people. It was an embrace of God and rock and roll. And you can hear it and you can see it. And when you come into contact with the resonant vibration of that, you start to understand like that it's way heavier, way more complicated, way richer, and it continues to resonate. Welcome back to BYOD Special Edition South by Southwest 2012. Um, we've been talking across a range of incredible stories that are premiering here in Texas, and uh, the sun's finally come out, so we've moved to the porch of the Fast Company Grill. Um, and we have today the source directors, Jody Willie and Maria Dinopoulos. Yeah, I can curse on the internet. Thank God. Okay, we're going to leave that one. <laughs> it's my, that was my second try. Um, they came from their premiere just now. Um, and uh, how, how does it feel, you guys? It's like the genie, you let the genie out of the bottle. <laughs> it feels amazing, actually. It feels great to finally uh, have the public see the film. And it's, um, it seemed like it was well-received. It was oversold, and we were happy about that, that a lot of people came to the screening. Are you exhausted after racing to finish it for, for the premiere? Uh, yeah. <laughs> I've never put my body through this extreme of an experience before. We, we finished the film maybe five days before we left. And uh, so we, we were seeing it for the first time all the way through on the screen. At least you didn't with fly everybody. with it. That yeah. happens where people roll into Park City like with it in their trunk or they fly here with the movie in trouble with the festival because they're like, what? You know, but um, but that's awesome. It's the end of a long road. This project actually was generated out of a book that Jody published. And so it's kind of, Jody and I have been friends, full disclosure, for many, many years. And it's funny because I've seen her under deadlines so many times in my life and like unable to go out or up for nights on end. So for her to say that this put her to the ultimate test is saying a lot. <laughs> Just true. Yeah. Um, Books are easy. Tell, tell everybody what the film's about. Now you can tell us, but um, we know what the film's about. Sure. Because we've been fans um, of the film for a while. The book is, uh, the film and the book, but the film is about a, um, a utopian communal experiment, a group that existed in Los Angeles in the 70s, had a very popular restaurant that all the movie stars went to, um, had some... Uh, uh, important children of uh, you know celebrities, people like that, and um, had a rock band. And the film is about their time in Los Angeles and their time in Hawaii and their, their kind of painful downfall. And it was interesting because I remember when you were first doing the book and I was making Join Us. I think it was like 2007 you were making the book and I was making Join Us, which was about a cult. Um, but I it was very negative experience. And you said, well, this is a good cult. This is a nice cult. Uh, this is the kind of cult that people come out of and they do, they go on to do extraordinary things. Um, and then the film, it's, it's a very, it's like looking at it from a prism, I feel like, and it's not all good and it's not all bad. 
and the and the film seems to tell the story more of the motivation of why one would be drawn into a group like that, which is clear in the absolutely extraordinary archival footage of that. So at first, he proved his greatness, right? Uh, to many people. <laughs> it seems like people were in awe of Father Yoke. Yeah, I mean, I should clarify. I mean, it's not that they were a good cult. I mean, what they were was they were a utopian group with uh, high ideals, and it was a very kind of, it was in some ways a messy experience, but the aims were high. And according to a number of the family members that we interviewed, everybody really, um, he gave more than he took, Jim Baker, the leader. So he really did uh, transform their lives in many ways. But he was a flawed dude, you know. I mean, he, he, had, he had his... His shadow side. So, so there were things like Is there that. that. I mean, did did you ever think about like power corrupts and absolute power corrupts? Absolutely. Like, did he transform over the course of the story? I think it's a pretty clear message in the film that they, you know, that the power can corrupt, the best of intentions, you know. But he, but he, he was able to remain vulnerable at the end, unlike a lot of these people, and he was able to admit to his followers that he was not God. He was just a man like any other man, and that's that counted a lot for me, but I don't know. What do you think, Maria? I mean, I think our point of view on it, too, was that we weren't trying to condemn or praise the family members and just let them, the wide spectrum of their uh, pr perspectives and their personalities come out and then just let the audience make those, mo those decisions because what's happening is that this film has... Uh, it seems to elicit very strong reactions, and some people think, like, you know... God, you just like whitewashed it, and it was just like you know, it's just too too glossed over. Or other people have like you know very opposing views on it. And I think what's important is that just to say that you know people can take from it what they want, and they're going to react based upon their emotional response to the characters. But um, you know, there's definitely it definitely elicits very strong reactions. So talk a little bit about the archival footage, because the film has so much archival footage, and some of it's incredible, particularly um, the baby birthing scene, for example, which is just amazing, and which kind of, he has, a, he has a miracle moment, essentially, a godlike moment. How did you guys find that footage, and, and how, how, did, how, how, did you, how did you get that? Well, uh, that was Isis Aquarian. The woman who has the doc, she's got the archive, the Source Family archive of hours of home movies and thousands of stills and hundreds of hours of audio. That was her first night in the family, and she was invited to come to the family to film the birth. So, so that was partially her coming from this rock photographer. Her fiance was a rock photographer, so he had all this really good gear. And um, so they filmed it that way. But also at the same time, there was a filmmaker, Don Como, who had a daughter in the family and who made this film, Aliens from Spaceship Earth. So we actually had a mix, a very unusual convergence happening in a mix of film uh, covering that, documenting that. But the family documented themselves, um, I don't know, maybe compulsively all the time. I mean, much more than other groups I've researched uh, who lived during this time and that's really what makes them remarkable why do you why do you think that that was i mean do you think that they felt that they were living like a the way that we should live that that, that that's why they were doing it to send a message ultimately or to leave a time capsule of a sort of ideal lifestyle well i think they were very they had a very successful restaurant so they had the means to do it and i think that during that time, I mean, my parents took Super 8 films, you know, of our family. People had Super 8 cameras, and, and they probably just felt like they wanted to um, sort of document the importance of what they were doing. I mean, what they were doing was th they knew they were living in this very heady time and that they were going on this roller coaster, and I think they just understood the importance of that, and that's why they um, took the efforts to self-document. I have to say also, knowing Isis Aquarian, she has the heart and soul of a documentarian. I mean, she is always documenting, even now. And I think that really a lot of it had to do with her personality, being the compulsive documentarian that she is. I've worked with a number of sort of like amateur photographers uh, who have assembled these archives, you know, over decades that document these American sub she is. I've worked with a number of sort of like amateur photographers uh, who have assembled these archives, you know, over decades that document these American subcultures. And she's really one of the you know, she's a classic example of one of those just compulsive documentarians who, who documents not for career motives or anything else, but documents out of love or, or obsession. You know, she was very compelled by it all. Was it the existence of the music and of her film 
archive that made you think this is because you've made a lot of you've published a lot of books about extraordinary subjects and you and I even went down the road of starting to collaborate on films about a couple of those books but was it this treasure trove of of actual archival that made you go I have to do this there were two things the treasure trove was was absolutely when when I when we saw the the home movies I just I couldn't believe my jaw was just dropping to the ground over and over again I could not believe what existed because I've never seen this with any other group like that so so definitely in that case but also um, when I was doing the book as I got to know the family members I was just blown away with how interesting they all were as people it really to me what became more interesting than the archival footage was the family members themselves and how they've transformed over the years and and tr and just live these really unique what i consider to be authentic lives where they've really followed their own path which is not what you expect when you see a, a cult you know you expect these like people who have no sense of individuality and it was the farthest thing from the case and they were charming and they were funny and so, so really, it was those two things combined. This is the uh, beautiful thing, uh, being a documentary filmmaker, because you come in with these stereotypes that you don't even realize you had. You know, like when I went to the Cold Treatment Center with Join Us, I expected people to... I expected... The, I wait, was waiting for the families to show up, and when they showed up in SUVs and BMWs and, like, collar shirts and whatever, I realized at that moment, oh, my God, I expected people in robes and bald heads and, you know... Um, and that was just the, the very tip of the iceberg of the stereotypes I had about, oh, people in cults are not smart. So, for example, in your film as well, some of these people have gone on to have incredible careers, highly successful oh, yeah. careers. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, one of them is, is a pioneer of stem cell research. And for me, what I, what I realized just doing the book originally in is one of the most undervalued sort of uh, misrepresented per periods uh, of the six, you know, movements of the 60s and 70s. And, and where, you know, pop culture after Manson, after Altamont started, you know, the media started to look at these groups as being like brainwashed, dirty hippies, failed experiments, the communes. And what I found through my research before we even started this movie is that some of the people that came out of that subculture are the, the greatest visionaries of our time. Steve, and jo Steve Jobs could have been in the source family he was living on a commune he went to india he followed a guru stuart brand one of the founders of the internet was also one of these you know crazy hippies who was involved in radical the, the radical social experiment subculture and some of the most progressive ideas of our time the slow food movement the mind body spirit movement um, the natural birthing you know trends that are happening all were born during that period with those groups the source family was one of thousands of groups. What was it uh, like yeah. getting the family members to participate in the film? I mean, I'm sure that there must have been some concern that it would have been an exploitive film or maybe the tone wouldn't have been appreciated by the family members. But what, what was that like? It, it definitely took a while. And I think because Jody worked on the book with them and there was so much success with the book and they saw that they, they were... Um, you know, pretty supportive of the of the representation in the book. I think that definitely elicited trust for the film, but yeah, it it, def it definitely took time. It did. I mean, when I when I first did the book and the book came out and we did our first events in Los Angeles, there were family members who were afraid to participate because they'd really been demonized. And and when they came back to LA, people were like, "Oh, you sucker! Your leader jumped off a cliff," or thought they were Satanists, and they were really kind of quiet about the whole experience for many years so it, it was really when we did our first events and they sold out they were enormously successful they had all of these like hipster kids coming up to them like oh my gosh i'm so happy to meet you that that helped uh to, to sort of change their their view of the experience and just see see more of the totality of it you know not that they were you know stars but yeah uh, I'm gonna fight you for, uh, I know. I've got some <laughs> okay, I've got one question about the hipster kids. Were the hipster kids fascinated by the Source family because of the cult or because of the music of the Source family? I think it was both things. I mean, the music has had this sort of like underground following for many years with psych fans and record collectors. So there are definitely diehard fans that existed. Um, but when the book came out, a lot of. Um, attention there's a lot of publicity for it and and because the family members were so striking and they were interested in these radical ideas i think that there are a lot of young kids then and even now um who are interested in consciousness and spirituality but we really haven't had um 
any subcultures that have that have uh, explored that since the 80s or since the 70s the 80s and the 90s were very materialistic and and so I think that um, it wasn't the cult aspect is always a draw people are fascinated with cults but I think a lot of it is they saw that the source family were doing things that they never that I never experienced in the 80s you know and that they were um, learning things that they wanted to learn so I think that was a genuine interest and then there's also the garb we, we must Call Use attention to your outfit today. <laughs> do do explain. Um, uh, you, I mean, you're a little bit of a shaman witch yourself. As I hope that's okay I, that, that I'm that, outing I, you on the. Yeah, it's, I don't. I can't speak on that, but that would um, be a good thing. But I would say that, uh, that this this what I'm wearing right now is it's actually an Afghani cleric's robe from the 80s that I had tailored to fit my body. And uh, and this is something I found at a, at a thrift store in Baltimore like 15 years ago. I think it's a secret brotherhood ritual uh, necklace. It's a very, I mean, it, it's not your everyday outfit, although you do wear this sometimes, but you are, just came from the premiere of the movie. Were you feeling like you wanted to be, you know, dressing like you could have been? I mean, it's, it's, I guess my question is, you seem fascinated by subcultures, right? And, uh, mm -hmm. and everything about them. Yeah. What, did you come to any sort of, conclusions in making this film it's almost like because you never really got to be in one yourself yes right yeah mm -hmm. yeah i would say that the conclusions that i came to and i can't wait to hear what maria says but uh for me personally the conclusions i came to working with this material for many years um would be that i feel like the the post acid consciousness subculture the cosmic consciousness explosion that happened in the early 70s up until about 76 when cocaine took over i would say that that period of exploration uh transformed the lives of the young people within it in ways that that a lot of people in our generation can't even begin to understand and that that subculture to me having explored subcultures from like the 1840s up until now is one of the most potent and undervalued subcultures of our time because of the ideas that were explored and because of the productive the things that eventually grew out of it do you think you would have joined the source had you been uh, on yeah. Sunset oh, yeah. Boulevard yeah. at that oh, yeah. No, I totally drank the Kool-Aid. Maria is another story. <laughs> and that's why she was so great to bring in. for the. She was essential for the film to get a balance. That, that was my next question was how you two work together as co-directors. Yeah. Um, but Maria, what was your you know point of entry and connection on, a, on an emotional and spiritual level to this? Well, I came into the project after, after the book had already been out in the world and, and Jody had done a bunch of events and um, you know our one thing that you realize when you're directing a documentary is that there are so many aspects to, to directing a documentary I mean it's just it's it's so different than, than a narrative film and um, I suppose my point of entry was that I, I feel like I sort of balanced things out a little bit just in terms of the tension of the uh, story and sort of bringing some perspective to it, like an outsider perspective to it, because Jody was so embedded on the inside. So I feel like I was able to step back and say, you know, that sounds like gobbledygook. I don't know what the hell they're saying. Like, can they just speak plain English? And so, I mean, <laughs> I, I, I hope that I brought like a breath of fresh air to that aspect of it. And... Um, and just trying to, you know, craft the helping to craft the arc of the story and to really um, uh, just infuse it with some perspective. Would you have joined the source, do you think, back then? No, I would not have. <laughs> so how long was the filmmaking process for this movie? And, and, you know, how much new footage is in the movie percentage wise versus archival footage? What well, you know, over how many years or months or did it take to we shoot and edit? We spent four years making this film, and then Jody spent actually longer than that because she was developing it prior to, to our collaboration. So probably for you, like another year and a half on top of the four years. So off you go to make another film tomorrow, right? <laughs> <laughs> Woo! Sure. <laughs> yeah. Really? No. <laughs> right. I think we need a vacation for at least a few weeks just to recover and, and get our bearings, but maybe watch some movies while we're here. Yeah, that would yeah. be... And, and then how did you finance the film? We had independent investors. We were very lucky. We were able to find private investors who were 
as crazy as we were. <laughs> and, and it was we're always a touch and go situation, though. I mean, uh, that's something we try to cover on our show because there's a lot of budding filmmakers out there, and um, you know, it's it's a it's a bumpy road. Oh yeah, uh, it's a marathon basically making a film. And with a doc, it goes on way. You would never, you know, I always say that I would never have started, you know, Dig or something with, with, without, if I had thought I'd do it for seven years. Yeah. Right. Like if anybody told me that, I would never have even started. I tell people. You think it's a year. Yeah. It's like, it's, it's like starting a restaurant or, or start like a book publishing company. You never know like how insane it is until you're too deep in and you can't go back. That's what doing a documentary is like times 10. Do you think yeah. uh, the financing was the, the biggest obstacle you guys faced, or could you talk a little bit about some of the major obstacles in, in the filmmaking process? I would say the financing was probably the biggest obstacle. And it's just, it's also a time sucking thing because you apply for grants and, and then you like look back and you, you just think, I could have just worked extra hard and made that money <laughs> There's that another I spent one. putting the grant together. It's so hard when you have so many characters. I mean, Join Us was like that too. If you're telling the story of a group, it's totally different than. A movie like Jeff that we right. covered today, where it's it's Jeff. It's about Jeff Dahmer. You know, it's one person's psyche. You know, this is about so many characters, and you probably had to rein that in and clarify that. The edit must have been just like, did were there times where you played it for people and they said, we have no idea who's talking right now. Well, I think we started off with a lot of characters and we pared it down. And our first edit was three hours. I mean, we had a really hard time honing the story because they're all so fascinating as characters. I mean, they all could have their own documentary. So, and also just like, you know, forging the connections in the, narratively too, like just sort of uh, making the connections and, and like weaving the tapestry too was made it difficult to you know, in the cutting in the cutting room for sure. We had a really talented editor. Her name is Jen Harrington, and she she when she came on board, she helped us really sort of like focus um, the connections between the characters and the story, which made a huge difference because we were sort of going back and forth between is it Father Yod's story or is it the family story because his story is so compelling. But then of course their story is ultimately more compelling I, I feel and so so we we always were kind of going back and forth between those things and yeah so tell our audience where they can learn more about you guys more about the film more about the family members and the musicians so you know people have access to the music and whatnot do you want me to speak on that okay um we have a website called the source doc.com the source doc.com we have a Facebook page and a, a Twitter page. A Twitter name. The Twitter name is Yodhead, and uh, that's our Y-O-D-H-E-A-D. handle. Y-O-D-H-E-A-D. Yes. yes. And uh, the Source family actually has a website. It's yahoa.org. It's Y-A-H-O-W-H-A.org. And the band, I should mention, um, has a, they made they made all these incredible records during the family that that only you know that are worth like a thousand dollars a piece now because they were so rare and um drag city has released um a number of albums already of their music when the book came out five independent labels released source family music in, in the same year but drag city has sort of taken the source family under their wing and uh, they're planning on releasing um hopefully the soundtrack we'll see <laughs> and another album soon yeah. we want to let you go because it's the day of your premiere and it's south by southwest which has much to offer you um a, a veritable feast of activities but um uh, are there other members of the of the source that are here with you also enjoying the experience yes we have three family members here that are in the film isis aquarian electricity aquarian and magus aquarian are they having a blast they seem to really be having a blast yeah <laughs> yeah they seem very happy about and, the whole and thing. are they and is everybody very happy with the film in the family yeah yeah, uh, we've that's heard. That's a rare. That's great. A bunch of film, a bunch of family members said they cried, which is really means a lot. You I'm know, sure it was a very special time of their lives, right? Um, anyway, everybody, please check out the source. Um, it they're finalizing their distribution or even beginning distribution talks now, so we have no idea where you will finally see the film, but it will come out. Um, and uh, hopefully we've enticed you to check out the source. Thanks so much, Jody and Marie. Thank you so Thanks much for, for having, having us. Really appreciate Have it. Have fun. Enjoy. Okay. Cheers. When I hit L.A., when I hit L.A., I ended up hanging out um, in this household where Rob Reiner and Richard Dreyfus live in Morro Canyon. And I met this very famous rock photographer, Ron McBelly.
And that was the start of a three-year love affair that was very intense. We were engaged and we were going to get married and have kids. Ron and I were casting for a photo shoot. And he said, um, I need Jesus, lots of Jesuses. I drove down to the source and there was all these great looking men in white robes with their long hair. And I said, is Jim Baker here? So out comes this man. And I just looked at him and I just went, oh my God. And he just gave me a big hug. He just said, welcome, welcome home. What I just saw held more for me than anything that I had. And Ron would not come with me. At the time, I was shooting uh, groups like the Beach Boys, Led Zeppelin, the Rolling Stones, the Doors, Jefferson Airplane. And you think I'm going to live up my career and my art and wait on tables? She had nothing. She didn't have a bank account. She had given him everything she owned. down to the source and there was all these she had nothing she didn't have a bank account she had given him everything she owned 